coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. Most of your cutthroat are going to be along the edges of the river. They really orient towards structure. If you're effectively fishing for cutthroat, you're going to snag up some flies and, and break them off. You want to get as tight to the wood as you can without actually hooking the wood because they're in that deep stuff and they, they like to ambush you know, minnows and things like that as, as they drift by. That was Scott Wilson with a nice tip on finding cutthroat trout, cutties, bullies, steelies, and coho today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the show. Quick reminder, our giveaway is going on right now for the big Steelhead uh, giveaway. This is the Steelhead School giveaway at uh, with Jeff Liskey. We're heading up there. I'm going to head up with Jeff. We're going to be hitting the Steelhead Alley area of the Midwest. This is one area I've been doing a lot of uh, work on with podcasts, talking to a lot of people. So I'm excited to go up there and share that uh, experience with some of you. You can go to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway right now to join that, or you can send me an email if you're interested and find out more information on how to just uh, join that trip directly. We got six slots available. Today's episode is presented by Jackson Hole Fly Company, a new kind of online fly shop. They design and manufacture their own high quality fly rods, reels, gear, and over a thousand fly patterns. You can get 25% off your first order right now. Head over to jhflyco.com slash swing to get started right now. That's jhflyco.com slash swing. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to Jackson. Today's episode is also sponsored by Fairflies, creating ethically sourced premium fly tie materials with their 5D brushes. You simply tie better flies faster. Fairflies creates intentional supply chains so you can change the world with every fly you tie. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash fairflies right now. That's F-A-I-R-F-L-I-E-S. Scott Willison takes us into the Skagit River and the diversity of species the Skagit has to offer. We find out what's up with the steelhead uh, in the current status up in the Skagit and why bull trout, cutthroat, and coho are Scott's go-to fish. We find out uh, which one of these, if he if he had to pick only one, cutthroat, coho, or bull trout, which one would he choose? We also find out about the Confluence Fly Shop, Scott's Fly Shop today. So we're going to talk about that briefly and dig into everything Skagit. So without further ado, here we go. Scott Wilson from theconfluenceflyshop.com. How's it going, Scott? Great. Thanks for having me, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, coming on here. And uh, today we're going to chat on uh, a little bit on the Skagit River, a name that, um, you know, it's kind of become synonymous with steelhead, right? Because, I mean, you've got the Skagit types of, uh, of spay lines, that whole thing, right? And it, it's it's really interesting history. We're probably going to dig into a little bit on the steelhead um, because obviously a lot of people, you know, are interested in the steelhead. But we're going to also touch on a whole broad range of Skagit River fishing topics uh, but you also have a fly shop, so we're going to dig into that as well. So before we get into the shop, the fishing, and Skagit, uh, take us into how you first got into fly fishing. Well, many, many years ago, uh, I, I was I w- was always interested in fishing growing up as a kid, but uh, didn't really have parents that fished. And so kind of dabbled for a few years with with a spinning rod, and, and I always knew I enjoyed it. But uh, one, one day when I was around 12... Uh, I was on a hike up in the Alpine Lakes wilderness uh, with my mom, and I saw a guy in this mountain lake uh, kind of standing on a on a boulder field and and fly casting, and he was just catching trout after trout. And uh, I looked at what he was doing, and it it was just kind of magical to me. And 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 immediately. I knew that's what I wanted to do. So I begged my mom. I, I had a birthday coming up and said, you know, I really want to figure out this fly fishing thing. And uh, so at, at the time, uh, we, we actually, I grew up in Renton, Washington, and uh, we, we had a little fly shop in downtown Renton called the Royal Coachman. Oh, yeah. And um, she took me down there and I, I met the owner and, and, uh, kind of got situated, got myself a little uh, nine foot five weight uh, Cortland outfit 
and uh, and took to it. Um, some of my my local rivers that I grew up fishing were uh, the the Cedar River, right there in Renton. I fished the the Middle Fork of the Snoqualmie a lot and, and things like that. But I I just I absolutely loved it. I I couldn't get enough of it. And uh, and so Renton is. Um... Yeah, so for those that don't know, you're kind of up in uh, Washington, near Seattle. So you grew up near yeah, Seattle, and then Bellingham, you're in Bellingham now, right? I'm in Bellingham now, um, but I, I grew up just south of Seattle. Yeah, just south of Seattle, exactly. And there's, yeah, and there's obviously, and then and then from Bellingham, how far is is the Skagit from, from Bellingham? Uh, depending on uh, which section you fish, uh, to get to the lower river that flows through Mount Vernon, uh, we're about 30 minutes away. Yeah, thirty minutes. Nice, yeah. right on. So basically, in that that story has come up a lot, right? People, you see somebody fishing or some random stranger on the river, right? And then you're like, oh my god, this magic! In fact, I w- we just released an episode of uh, a re-release. We kind of occasionally do some of the uh, old past episodes, but John Girock and and he told a similar thing, right? And a lot of people have those same intros. But um, how did you go from that into the Confluence Fly Shop? When did you, when did the idea, did you know back then that you're going to have a fly shop? You know, I never in my wildest dreams imagined I would, I would own a fly shop. It's, it's kind of a, a long and circuitous road to get there. It kind of starts with, uh, with, with finding Bellingham. I went to Western Washington University in the early nineties as a, and was an English major and Western Washington is in Bellingham and uh, just absolutely fell in love with the town. Um, And and from that time knew that at some point in my life, I wanted to end up living in Bellingham and then graduated from Western, ended up moving back down to Seattle and uh, and working down there in the tech industry for for several years. And then my wife and I kind of got sick of of just all the hustle and bustle of the city and, and knew we wanted to be someplace a little quieter. So we, we just sort of start, started looking at, at different areas we liked and, uh, we, we decided to, to move up to Bellingham. So somewhere in that time frame, I had actually gone back to school and got my teaching certificate. So the original plan was to, to come up, uh, to, to Bellingham. I was going to teach middle school or something along, along those lines. And we, we came up here, I, I substitute taught a whole bunch. Uh, I, I also supplemented the income. I worked for uh, a nonprofit um, fisheries enhancement group up here, our, our local one, the, the Nooks, Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association. And then a few years down the road, I, I met a, a guy that I, I really got along with who uh, who was kind of guiding here here and there, both on the Skagit and the Olympic Peninsula, uh, a little bit down on the Stillaguamish River as well. And uh, I, I started doing some guiding for him on the side. And all, all the while, we, we were talking about opening up a, a, a fly shop and thought that would be pretty cool. It was right around 2007, sort of the, the, the last longstanding fly shop in, in Bellingham, uh, which was H and H Outfitters had closed down, and uh, so we we found ourselves uh, without a fly shop around for for quite some distance. Uh, the nearest ones were actually up in British Columbia. Oh wow! Um, up in Vancouver, or yeah. not Vancouver? Yeah, yeah, or just just across the border. There, oh, okay. there were a couple in Abbotsford. Oh, in Abbotsford, um, yeah, Abbotsford, yeah. But uh, yeah, so we 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 thought there was kind of a niche for it up here. And, uh, and so in 2012, we sort of started the, the planning process and then, uh, opened the shop in, uh, early, early spring, late winter of, of 2013. And then, uh, uh, had a business partner for about a year. And then, uh, as, as often happens with, with small businesses, we kind of had different, different directions we really wanted to go. And so I bought him out after a year and, uh, and been at it ever since. So we're, we're coming up on 10 years now. I can't believe how quickly the time has, has gone by, but, uh, for, for something I had never planned to do. Um, and, and that just kind of happened organically. I, 
looking back on it now, I, I just, I can't imagine doing anything else in, in this world. Right. It sort of encapsulates everything that, uh, that I love, um, in the, the fly fishing world from the, the fishing itself to, um, you know, getting to use my, my teaching skills to help other people grow and progress. And, uh, yeah, it's 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 a fantastic job. It's not an easy job. Any, no, and anybody that owns a small business, right, will tell you. And it's we're we're often very subject to kind of the the whims of the state and fishing regulations, and it it can have a a real direct impact on how how much traffic we're getting at the shop. All right. What is the one thing at the fly shop, or just in the fly shop in general, that you really you kind of love most? What's the one thing that gets you going it's really the the people growing up one of my my favorite uh sitcoms to watch was was always cheers oh nice uh it was a great show and i always had this this sort of notion in my head that i i wanted the fly shop environment to be to be a lot like cheers you know where everybody knows your name and uh yep people come in they feel really comfortable um, you can have a conversation there's, there's no ego, there's no pretension and it, it's turned out very much to, to be that way. Um, I've, I've made countless friends and, uh, you know, that through, through being at the fly shop that people I'll go on trips with people, people I'll fish with. And I just really enjoy that aspect of it. Um, yeah. we even have our, our own resident, uh, norm. Yeah. A, who's that? It's a guy who's in his early 80s now named uh, Jerry Wells. Yeah. Who has uh, lived in Whatcom County for his entire life. And he worked for, I want to say it was 20 years or so at uh, at H&H Outfitters. And every mm. everybody knows him. And, yeah. and he still comes by the shop on average about once a week. Uh, he'll often bring us, uh, he'll bake us brownies. He brings us produce from his garden nice. and, and he'll, he'll just hang out and BS for, for two, three hours at a time. And yep. uh, he's, he's a wonderful guy and everybody knows him. So there's, that's great. There's this constant, uh, Jerry, right. And seen you in years. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really special. That is cool. Yeah, we. It's funny. We had an episode recently, uh, episode three fifty one. We talked. We were talking Virginia, but um, uh, Christian noted the same. Th- well, I said that about Cheers. I brought the same thing up. I said it's kind of like that, and he hadn't even didn't even know of Cheers the show actually. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> aging aging ourselves a little bit, but it, yep. it's pretty good. The the Cheers is a was definitely a classic. Um, so so that's it. I mean, basically, you love the fly shot, and you and you do a little bit of guiding as well. Um, I, I don't guide anymore. It, it kind of reached a point, uh, where a lot of our, you know, kind of our bread and butter fisheries, like, like the Skagit and the, the Stilly, uh, the seasons became so condensed or, or in some cases wouldn't happen at all that it was, it was hard to, hard to plan your guiding around. I've, I've always kind of felt like, uh, you know, at least in Western Washington, uh, unless you're a Puget Sound Sea Run Cutthroat guide that that offers a pretty stable year-round fishing opportunity, you've got to be pretty nomadic to make it work and and be willing to travel and you know sometimes that means spending the winter on the Olympic Peninsula. That might mean yep. going over and and you know guiding on the Metal for the summer for trout. Um, and and so I, I decided. I would rather focus on the shop and, uh, you know, have more time with my family and then, uh, and then also, uh, more, more time to fish for myself. Yeah. I, I loved guiding. I loved helping people. There's, there's something really fulfilling about helping somebody else get into their, their first fish and, and seeing that, that excitement. But, uh, it's not the same as fishing yourself. No. No, and you've been there, and, and you brought up the Skagit. I wanted to, to touch on that, obviously, today. So you've been there a while. You've seen, I mean, have you seen the 
the ups and downs of the schedule, or I'm not even sure, maybe it's been more downs, but what's it look like? If you look back on the history of it, do you kind of know most of that history? Quite a bit of the history. I, I started fishing the Skagit uh, really in the early 90s when I came up to Western. And, and at that time, like most of our, our northern Puget Sound rivers, um, all of them had an annual uh, spring catch and release season that ran from, from February 1st uh, through the end of April. And uh, they all had decent runs of, of steelhead you could actually get out and find a few runs to fish. It wasn't necessarily overly crowded, uh, largely because there, there were enough open options. People could spread themselves out. Kind of fast forward to now, uh, all of our rivers, uh, like the Skykomish, the Still Stilaguamish, uh, the Nooksack up here in Bellingham, uh, they, they all mostly closed down at the end of January. The, the one wild card is the, the Skagit and Sock that uh, occasionally has a, a spring catch and release season mm -hmm. on it. Um, we don't typically find out till the end of January based on the steelhead forecast numbers if we're gonna if we're gonna get a fishery on the Skagit or, and, and Sock or not. The years when it does, every, every year the season looks a little different. Sometimes it's uh, it's open four days a week. Um, sometimes it's open three days a week. Um, sometimes it's open for a month and a half. Sometimes it's open all, all the way through the end of April. But it's it's tough to plan. And, you know, for anybody that's that's not familiar with the, the Puget Sound, greater Seattle area, it's an immensely populous area. Um, and so we're, we're talking about funneling all the, all the steelhead interest, all, you know, all the people that want to fish for steelhead into a relatively short piece of river in, in Western Washington. And it just gets crowded and, and often overrun with, with people. And so it's, it's definitely not the experience I, I first came to find on the river and, uh, you know, fishing in the in the early 2000s in particular, like I could count on at least hooking up with a steelhead or two just about every outing. Um, it was it was pretty consistent. There were a lot of fish. Uh, the the Skagit is a big river. It's the third largest river in the state. But it you know that that water is just nice, low gradient, three to five foot deep mm, flats, perfect. and and just absolutely tailor-made to swinging flies for steelhead mm -hmm. so there's there's a big disparity between you know the, the river when i first came to experience it and, and what it's become now yeah so there was a period in the you said in the 2000s when fish was pretty good was that like a, a decade there where it was pretty good yeah it was fairly consistent for for a decade or so yeah and that's the um yeah, I mean, it's not too dissimilar. I mean, obviously, these steelhead are all doing similar things out there and in the ocean. They've got different things they're coming back to. I mean, that's one of the challenges, right, where you look at where you're at. I, I don't know all the details, but obviously, that's a very populated area. Um, and then, uh, but even the OP, right, even the places like the OP, which are go into national parks. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Even those places are, so it's not just the, you know, it's not just the the freshwater stuff. I mean, it's obviously ocean conditions which makes it tough you know tough to have a solution but um yeah and it was the same you know a lot of these places where you saw a deep or you saw an increase in the 2000s and then after 2010 or whenever that was it started going downhill and now there are a lot of closures um but the schedule so i mean it's still open so that's a good thing do you see that as i i, I go back to this episode or episode 17 like many years ago when we first started scott uh, baker mcgarva talked about you know, we were talking about the Skagit and he said, um, you know, he's like, you know what, we just need, we just need to be able to fish it. Like you can't close the Skagit because people forget about the river. And he thought even like cutting your hook off and swinging a feather, right. Just to get the pole. What, what's your take on that? Do you feel like, um, the closures are, you know, hurt, um, the people that, that support that and that maybe they forget about the Skagit? I do tend to agree with them. I, I think that, uh, you know, in Washington in particular, a, a lot of the, the, the 
management regulations seem very black and white. Um, you know, something's either open and anything goes or, or it's closed. So, you know, I, l- I look at some of the fisheries in, in your neck of the woods, like the Deschutes, and yep. you're not allowed to fish from a boat. And I, I think that if, if our management agencies were able to think outside of the box a little bit more, there might be some opportunities for, for fisheries where they don't currently exist. Yeah. Who, who are the group up there, uh, Scott? Who, who are the groups? Because I think about the Deschutes is a good example that there were groups like, um, well, and people out there, we, you know, that, that were, you know, that were supporting it, right? Not necessarily governmental groups, but people that came out and were like, you know, we want this protection. Are there a bunch of those? There must be a bunch of those great groups up in your neck of the woods. There, there are a num- number of Washington-based groups um, that, uh, that, look at things like that. Uh, we, ha- we have groups like the Wild Steelhead Coalition, um, the Wild Fish Conservancy, um, several of our, our, our Trout Unlimited chapters. We, we have a very active uh, chapter of Trout Unlimited, the, the North Sound chapter based out of Bellingham. I'm actually a board member of the chapter and, and very involved. But when, the, when there are comment periods for fisheries and things Prior to the season, we, we tend to weigh in and, and comment pretty heavily on on those, those types of things. I I would prefer, in my mind, even a an extremely restrictive fishery is better than no fishery at all. Yeah, I think it's it's good to have eyes on the river and people that are that are invested and 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 that care. To an extent, there there's a lot that's beyond your control in terms of getting the state to do one thing or another. Um, in Washington, it's particularly complicated because it's not just Washington state making all the department of fish and wildlife, making all the decisions. It's, it's a co-managed fishery. And so you've got to get, you know, buy-in from, from the, the tribes and, and kind of get everybody on the same, same page. One of the things I've I've really kind of shifted to in the the last few years um, through Trout Unlimited, um, I've been doing uh, steelhead red counts and spawner surveys um, for about six years now on tributaries to the Skagit. And uh, last year, uh, one of my my biggest honors was uh, being asked to work with uh, Bill McMillan. Uh, oh, nice! To help him with, the, he's got uh, five key tributaries to the middle Skagit that that uh, he's been surveying now for fourteen years, and and Bill is a, a, one of one of the most active and and fit guys in his late seventies I've ever met. He's just never stopped going, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, you know he's kind of kind of looking at at some point he's not going to be able to do the surveys. So want, wants to ensure they continue. So I, I spent mm-hmm. most of the last spring and late winter working with him to learn his survey reaches and getting out there and, and looking for reds, looking for steelhead. And I've personally found like that, that experience is every bit as fulfilling as going out and, and swinging one up on the fly. And so mm-hmm. I, I try to encourage people, you know, if, if if we can't get the state to open it or we can't control the, the the forecast or the numbers coming back, this is a way that you can still be connected to the fish and, and still appreciate them. And uh, yeah, that's great. And make some positive contributions. You know, we try to do that too. I think that's the thing you can, you know, with the groups, I think that's the call to action is that, yeah, you can support them, you know, monetarily and that's great. But I think even more powerful is getting, doing volunteering and getting out there and getting involved with whether it's TU or any of these other great groups. We're going up to, uh, we've got Alaska trip coming up here in a couple of weeks and we got the, you know, Susitna River Coalition who's a tiny little group up there. Nobody outside of Alaska probably would know of them, but they're doing great work, right? And, uh, and that's the thing is how do we get more support for these, these groups? Because those are the ones that are going to help, um, definitely protect, right. Protect what we got. But, um, well, let's dig in. I, you know, the Skagit river, I want to kind of look at, uh, some of the species. So we, we talk in steelhead, we're not going to dig deep into like a steelhead episode today, but we are going to talk about the other species and fishing opportunities. Um, so start there a little bit. What, what are the other species other than steelhead? What does the Skagit offer that's, you know, people could uh, go out there and fish for? 
Sure. So the, the Skagit hosts all five species of uh, Pacific salmon. A couple of them are really important to the fly angler, and then uh, the, the others not, not so much. Um, but uh, in odd number of years, we get uh, pig salmon returns that are just absolutely amazing. I'm not holding my breath for, for 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, like most of Western Washington, we had some, some pretty epic flooding uh, last November. Uh, that would have scoured a lot of reds, and and so I, I think we may see a few years to to rebuild. But the the pink salmon fishing on the Skagit can be um, nothing short of uh, uh, Alaska quality. Uh, there there are just so many fish. The coho fishery is is pretty outstanding as well, and it's it's a really long return window for the coho. So there are coho coming into the Skagit as early as July. And we're still seeing fish, um, sometimes remarkably bright fish, coming in in January and February. So about half the year there's coho coming in. Uh, wow. in, in terms of the fishing, uh, October, October, November are my two favorite months to fish for coho on the Skagit. It's once it weather cools down a little bit. Um, but even yesterday I was, I was up fishing, uh, the upper river around marble Mount, And, uh, at the end of the day, we, we were seeing big waves of bright coho coming into a big back eddy and, and working their way up. Uh, they, they were probably bound for the, the cascade river, one of the tributaries. Today's episode is sponsored by tokens fly shop, providing superior quality products at an affordable price. They've got the good stuff going. Justin and the family has you covered when looking for unique in-house products as well as some of the best brand names. They got it all covered. And recently, they've added uh, rods and lines and reels, and they're up in their game this year. So if you want to get the goods, not just the flight time materials, but get all the gear you need, one stop, Togans has you covered. I recently made a uh, another order with Togans, and uh, and it was it's always amazing how fast this stuff comes down. They're up across the border in Canada, but they've got their infrastructure in the U.S. as well. So this is a real easy one to put together. If you want to support a great fly shop and support this podcast, you got to check out Togans right now. You can head over to wetflyswing.com/togans. That's T-O-G-E-N-S. They have a diverse selection of products, uh, like I said, and just click over there and take a look right now. That would be amazing, and I would appreciate it. Support this podcast in a great fly shop. Togans, T-O-G-E-N-S. Okay, back to the show. So the coho fishing, and this is really interesting because we're, you know, like I said, we're going up to Alaska, you know, and coho is going to be, um, you know, that's going to be a species that's going to be out there. But, um, you know, in the lower 48, you don't hear as much about coho opportunities because i think that's a little different right they're maybe harder to they're not as aggressive are, are up there are those fish talk about that like how are these fish like chasing your fly or how are you catching those fish they certainly can be i i will say like a lot of these early fish that are coming in now a lot of them are, are hatchery origin and they tend to not be very aggressive at all and so i i don't i don't spend a lot of time in in september and uh, and even early October targeting those fish because they they just don't bite great. Uh, the the late October, uh, November, and even December fish are probably the most similar to Alaska coho that I found in the lower forty eight. Um, in that they're they're big, they're they're aggressive. They'll they'll chase starlight leeches and dalai lamas and, mm-hmm. and big gaudy flashy stuff. Um, and they're they're just in, incredible fish, and uh, yeah, I, I get I get pretty excited about fishing those. How's that look? Is it is there a ton of people out there uh, targeting trying to go for those? Is it a lot of pressure? You know, it's it it's really not that that bad. Not like steelhead. It's nothing like like steelhead, and some of it is. You know, a lot of your pressure is in the form of uh, you know guys twitching jigs out of sleds or Mm. throwing vibraxes and things like that. So, um, in, in terms of coho fly water, I really try to look for 
those off channel sloughs and and the, the slow froggy water with lots of woody debris and the guys fishing gear can can fish all kinds of spots that I can't really effectively cover with a fly and and so they're there tends to be very little overlap. So most most of the time when I'm coho fishing on the Skagit, I, I don't see a lot of competition out there. Yeah, um, It's not nearly as crowded as, you know, when, when you're steelheading and you have people um, cycling through and, and two-stepping down, down yep. a run, it's easy for a traffic jam to, to occur when you've got, you know, too many people trying to fish the same water. Yeah. I think part of it is too, you, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, the, the weather can really suck in November. It's, uh, Oh yeah. It's, it's cold. It can be rainy. It's, it's the Northwest. It's, yep. it's wet. And, uh, that, that'll tend to keep a lot of people at home. But, uh, so I see it. So it's a little bit different habitat. You're fishing the sloughs and off channel. So yeah. take us there just a little bit. Well, let, let's, uh, I want to go back, let, let's circle back to coho in a little bit, but let's go down through an, a few other species. So what else throughout the year, you're talking November, October, November, December, uh, what other species do we have out here? You mentioned there's a few more salmon and I guess some trout fishing as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, so the Skagit also sees, uh, both, both fall and spring Chinook, um, those are really difficult on the fly. They tend to, it's not, it's not impossible, but they, they tend to, to favor the, the, the deepest, fastest flows. And, and there, there's a lot of big tanky water on the Skagit that, you know, it's sometimes 15, 20 feet deep where yep. you're, you're just not going to get a fly in front of them. Uh, it does get a pretty robust run of sockeye heading to the, the, the Baker River and Baker Lake. Uh, th- those fish, in my experience, uh, every now and again, you will you will be lucky enough to hook one. But when they're in the river, they're generally just not grabby at all. And and sockeye kind of have that tendency. Um, once upon a time, when I first started fishing the the Skagit in the the nineties. In November and early December, you you could just about walk around or walk across the river on the backs of chum salmon. Mm -hmm. Um, It had a huge chum salmon fishery. And now those, those numbers have dwindled to the point where it's been over a decade since we've had a a targeted chum fishery. And uh, some years you won't see any at all. Whereas, you know, you used to have to hold your nose walking the riverbank in, in December because it was just rotting chum carcasses everywhere. Wow. Um, so that, that one, unfortunately has taken a downturn. Um, but beyond the, the salmon kind of the, the ever present species that, uh, that seems to thrive in the, the Skagit and sock, um, is the, the bull trout, mm, um, bull trout, that's right. We've got a, we, we've got a sizable bull trout population, in, in both rivers, um, and several life histories within those bull trout, you within those bull trout populations, you've got, you've got resident fish that kind of hang out in the same pool all the time. You've got fish that, that migrate highly up and down the, the, the river, but stay in the river. And then, uh, as far as I know, we are the one, one of the only places in the world that actually has anadromous bull trout. So we we have sea run bull trout that'll leave the river and go out and, and feed in, in Skagit Bay and then go back up the river. I mean, there's there's plenty of anadromous char um, through, throughout the far north and, and uh, anadromous Dolly Varden, uh, but these, these are actually uh, classified as bull trout. And that that's a that's a really fun fishery. Yeah. What's that one look like? What, what time of year is the best time for bull trout? That one, you stand a pretty good chance at finding bull trout throughout the open season on the Skagit. So the Skagit typically opens the beginning of June and and will remain open through the 31st of January. And uh, the program changes a little bit in the in the spring, fishing a lot of kind of smolt or fry patterns, um, you know, swinging streamers that have that profile. Uh, works really well for bull trout in the summer. We fish a lot of sculpin, a, a lot of 
you know, large white streamers, uh, you know, stuff that looks like a white fish and, and other things that the bulls eat in the fall. I would say October and early November is you'll still find bull trout. A lot of times they're smaller pre spawning class fish. Cause a lot of the big ones will run way, way up the tributaries to spawn that time of year. So they're kind of absent from the, the Skagit itself. Um, but getting into November, late November, December, a lot of egg patterns. Uh, those, those bulls will, will sit behind salmon reds and, and, and eat loose drifting eggs and things like that. Um, I always tell everybody, you know, in, in November and early December, uh, you can't go wrong fishing any pattern uh, as long as it's sucking on an egg. So yep. kind of egg sucking leech themed fly yeah. tends to get noticed by, by just about everything in the river. Right. There you go. So, and then, and you mentioned the summer of the streamer. So if you were, I mean, you got a big, a wide range here. If you, let's take it to the summer. If you're fishing some of those sculpin style patterns, how are you finding fish then? What's the, what's the key to find a uh, bull trout? A lot, a lot of it, you're, you're going to look for, for kind of slower water, uh, in the summer. I really like, you know, water that's got a little bit of chop on it. So, so kind of the choppy flats, heads of riffles doesn't need to be particularly deep, but kind of those, those long glides, uh, mm-hmm. in the upper river when it's 80 degrees out and sunny, those, those fish kind of feel exposed and vulnerable. So they, they like to tuck in either, either to the riffles or, or sometimes some of the deeper pools. And then, uh, it, really the name of the game is just cover a lot of water. Yeah. Like swinging fish density overall on the Skagit, whether we're talking, uh, uh, resident rainbow trout or, or, or the, the big char, the bull trout, uh, you're not going to sit on a pool and just, you know, work it and catch fish after fish all afternoon. Uh, yeah. we, t- we tend to fish fast, take, you know, for swinging a run, um, tend to, uh, take big steps, uh, in the summer, I'll not only swing, but I'll, I'll either pump the rod tip or, or strip the fly back as well. Really get that fly moving. Um, th- those fish love to chase a fly. And generally, if I if I'm in an area and I've hit a few bull trout, like there's there's a good chance there's others around. But if if I fish a run and I, I'm I'm not finding fish, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the next one. Either, either hop in the boat and keep drifting, or drive up to a, a different spot. Is it kind of like steelhead where you'll swing a run and you might get a kind of a tip tap tug stuff like that, or is it more like fishing for like brown trout with streamers or something like that? It can actually be both. I would say in the winter when the water is, is much colder and, uh, and, and then right when it opens, I tend to do better presenting my fly the same way I would for a steelhead. Like just, uh, just let it swing. Don't touch it. If, if, if the water works and you can get that fly swim, swimming broadside so they can see the whole profile of your streamer, you're going to be better off. Um, that tends to be more effective, but, uh, during the summer, it's, it's going to be a lot more like brown trout fishing where you're, yeah. you're sometimes casting upstream, throw a, a downstream belly in your line and, and just start ripping that fly back to you. Right. That's cool, man. And how big are, what's a, what's a real nice big uh, bull trout? I would say an average fish is going to be, is going to be in the, 16 to 20 inch range you, you see a lot of those but uh we, we've caught bulls in this gadget up to 30 inches wow you know which which Jeez. are 10 pounds or so crazy they're, they're pretty big fish and i i would say like my favorite time to fish for them is is like this time of year and uh and then earlier when the river first opens i i think uh you know, a lot of a lot of guys will malign the bull trout because oh, they just don't they don't fight and and uh, they're not as as thrilling as catching a steelhead. I think a lot of that to me comes from the fact that you know in the late fall and winter you've got a bunch of people out there with 
13 and a half foot eight weights swinging flies for steelhead and the bulls you're catching at that time of year are are post-spawn fish they go up and spawn in the fall so these fish are these fish are gaunt and and right skinny and and beat up and you know whereas if you if you get fish especially the anadromous bull trout that have been out eating herring and smelt and sketch bay and then they come up the river i mean they're they're a fat deep bodied fish that uh that pulls really well and and th- they're kind of the ideal fish in my mind for a for a like a heavier kind of trout space setup like i, I most of the time i fish a, a, an 11 and a half foot four weight mm-hmm. um it's an absolute blast on on your average bull trout and and you you run into some big rainbows in this gadget as well too what are you using what's your um your setup there for uh like your line for if that like say that 11 half foot four weight what are you using for a line yeah so i i really like my my favorite line um i'll fish a lot of uh like commando opst commando mm-hmm. head type stuff i do really prefer a, a integrated spay line especially in the summer because you're you're doing a lot of stripping in addition to just swinging. And so that integration is going to prevent the line from hanging up in, in the guides. Um, my favorite line. So on my 11 and a half foot four weight Sage one, I'm throwing a 240 grain, uh, scientific angler Skagit light. Oh, good. Yeah. I was, I was just, we were doing a steelhead thing with Jeff Liske and he was, I was like, okay, what's the lines? And he was like, yep, the, the spay light. He loves the, the uh, Skagit spay light. Those are just awesome lines. They're, yeah, very well designed line, and it 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 just it works incredibly well on the Skagit. And then tip tip wise, uh, you know, on that setup, I'm, I'm usually using like ten foot eighty grain tips. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll I a lot of times do the the OPST commando tips. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you can get by in most of your fishing with their their riffle, their run, and, mm. and their bucket, and you've got kind of the whole water column covered with that. Yeah, that's perfect. Nice. So, well, let's keep going on this. I want to I want to circle around. We've been. Are we? Do we have any other species we want to add to this mix that we're missing here? Uh, I I would say the other one worth noting is uh, is sea run cutthroat or yeah. coast, coastal cutthroat, and that. That's a fishery that starts up, uh, you know, late August, September, and it'll usually go till about er- early November, um, it, as far as when when we're targeting them. Most of those fish are are gonna be found in the lower lower river, so I, I would say from between uh, Cedro Woolly and uh, and Lyman on down all the all the way through the the forks of the Skagit out into Skagit Bay. It's tough for the shorebound angler. It's, it's more of a fishery where you either, either need to be fishing out of a sled or, or be, be, you know, taking a drift boat or raft down the river. And you've got somebody on the, the oars kind of setting you up to take shots into the, the log jams and, and woody debris along the edge of the river. But the Skagit sea run cutthroat fishery is, is highly, underrated um there are a lot of fish and they are some of the biggest sea run cutthroat i found anywhere in in western washington so you know a 20 inch sea run cutthroat most everywhere is kind of the holy grail yeah that's right they're not terribly uncommon in the oh, in the wow. sketch it nice um yeah so it, a lot of fish over 16 inches that's amazing yeah so you got some big cutties and you got the bull trout the steelhead and and really the coho. But I guess the steelhead's the one that kind of gets left out just because of the ups and downs. But you got three species, um, you know, salmonid species that are yeah, that sounds pretty awesome, right? I mean, if you had to pick, so you, you could only pick one, you know, in any given year to fish for, which one are you choosing? Uh that's a tough question. <laughs> I I would say like for me, probably the the trout and the char. Uh, so the, like the rain, rainbow bull trout fishery up above the, the sock river. Um, so ba- basically from the town of Rockport on up is, uh, 
is my my favorite. And I think part of that is, you know, I was out yesterday on it. It was it was 85 degrees and oh, right. and beautiful <laughs> sunny yeah. out. Um but it's also a, it's also a really long season. Um you you know how the weather is here in the northwest. You, yep. you know, sometimes if we have a fishery that's really only good for November or or one or two months, uh some years we barely get to fish it because the river's just just out all the all the time. Uh last last year in our incredibly rainy fall, um you know, from mid October on, the Skagit was just, especially the the lower river below the sock, where where we really wanted to be focusing, was just out all the time. Oh right, yeah. So the cutthroat, and remind me again on that: are the cutthroat are you fishing? Are you catching those throughout like lower and upper river, or is it more upper? Really, the the cutthroat are more more of a lower river species and they they tend to like they'll come up the river in the fall they'll hang out for the winter and then they'll spawn in a in a lot of the the lower river tributaries um you know up up to about the town of concrete or so and it's it's not uncommon when i'm out doing steelhead red surveys we'll we'll see cutthroat reds especially in some of the smaller creeks as well right so then the cutthroat being lower than in your fishing form, the main stems, like you're saying, the, the rivers tend to get blown out or, or is that, or are they getting blown out during that time of year? They, they can get blown out during, during that time of year. So in, in some ways this, the Skagit is almost two different rivers. Uh, so the Sauk river, it's main tributary has some glacial influence. So like this time of year, you have so much glacial till coming out of the, the Seattle and the, and the White Chuck Rivers uh, tributaries to the Sock that a lot of the the lower river below the Sock entrance, like right right now, it's the color of concrete. Yeah. Um, yeah. As it cools down in September and the nights get longer, we'll start to see that clear up, and and then in the the lower river, you can expect two, sometimes three or four feet of visibility, and that's that's where we're down targeting the the cutthroat. Um, once you get above the sock, uh, the, the, the Skagit itself, it's, you, you know, it's like you're fishing a river in New Zealand. It's a, yeah, a, a tailwater fishery. The water stays cold. It's like the one place I'll, I'll still wear waders right. in, in August. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just gin clear up there. It's really cool. And are you still technique wise, are you doing the same thing, whether it's gin clear or less visibility for the cutthroat? Um, for the cutthroat, yes, for, for the most part. Um, and my, my favorite, so with cutthroat, typically using a, a, a floating line, sometimes an intermediate, or if, if I need to get down a little bit more, I, I might throw a, like a, a fast sink a short fast sink poly leader on, uh, on a floating line, but, uh, fish a lot of, uh, rolled muddlers, um, which is kind of a Canadian pattern. I don't know how popular that is everywhere else, but that that's one of our favorite flies up here. Mm-hmm. Um, reverse spiders, mm-hmm. uh, Mike, Mike Kinney pattern. Uh, that one is awesome. And then, uh, and my favorite one in the last few years has just been a like an all, olive chartreuse or black uh, sparkle bugger. And what's cool about all of those flies is that the coho will eat them too if the, if the water's on the clearer side. Right. So we fish a lot of a lot of people look in my my clear water coho box and they're like, oh, those are trout flies. I'm like, hmm. no, this is what I'm using for for salmon. Mm-hmm. Um, they they like that weird kind of drab olive stuff much of the time right nice so and describe a little bit on the the fishing for them again so so cutthroat fishing you got the flies you got a dry line what's the technique so technique is mo- most of your cutthroat are going to be a- along the edges of the river um they really orient towards structure so um you know any anywhere you've got you know, old pilings or, or woody debris, uh, log jams, 
some sometimes rip wrap banks or undercut banks. Right. Um, the stuff that's not easy to fish, right? L- it, large exactly. wood. You, you, one thing's for sure. You are going to lose some yeah. flies. But <laughs> yeah. if, if you're effectively fishing for cutthroat, you, you, you're, you're going to snag up some, some flies and, and break them off. You want to get as tight to the wood as you can without actually hooking the wood. Cause they're, they're, they're in that deep stuff and they, they like to ambush, uh, you know, other, you know, minnows and things like that as, as they drift by. So, uh, fish that and look for slow water. They, they like Mm -hmm. the slow froggy water, uh, with, with the woody debris in it. Um, and so the program is you kind of, you kind of drift along next to that and cast in and just strip your fly back, um, kind of perpendicular to the current and, uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there's there's no mistaking when they when they hit. Yeah, your it's a, it's usually a solid hookup. And are you waiting? You got a dry line. Are you waiting the flies a little bit to get them down? A lot of a lot of times, I'll I'll have a brass or tungsten bead. Um, some of them, like the reverse spider, I, I I find an unweighted one, like just a foot or so below the the surface, is often really effective. But uh, a lot of my rolled muddlers. Um, all, all of my sparkle buggers, um, I tie with a tungsten bead to just help it, help it get down quickly. When, when you're in a boat fishing that water, a lot of times you don't necessarily get a lot of time for your fly to set up and, and, and get down to where it needs to get down. Um, some, sometimes you're trying to cast into such a tight spot, like there's only one place you can put your fly and it needs to be down a foot or two um, when you start retrieving it. So I, I, I do like those tungsten beads. Yeah. Yeah, that is good. Nice. So that makes it easy. Yeah, with the, the dry line is pretty cool. And then, like you said, you could also be out in the same place. And literally, could you be stripping for, like, what, you're shooting for a cutthroat and you hook a coho? It happens all the time. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it's an interesting crossover fishery. The the, the challenging part of it is, you, you know, if I'm if I'm out and I'll, I'll get cutthroat all the time while I'm targeting coho, a cutthroat, unless it's exceptionally large, isn't necessarily super fun on an eight weight. But uh, I, I usually fish a four weight for cutthroat, uh, just just a nine, nine or nine and a half foot four weight. And uh, things get pretty interesting when you hook a 10 pound coho. On, yeah. On that what? setup. What, what is your, how do you get that in? What's your tip there? You, you cross your fingers and pray for the best. No, the, the, the first thing you, you try to do is get it out away from the wood. If, if you can, um, you stand half a chance if you, if you can get a big coho out into open water in the, the river, especially if, if you're, if you're in a boat, you can, you could drift out of that stuff and, and play it and land it. I mean, you, you can land a, a, a pretty big fish on a four weight in my experience, but, uh, you got to get them out of the woody debris. So if, if they take and they're in the middle of the logs, you have to just kind of clamp down and, and, yeah. you know, oftentimes with a big coho, that's going to mean you, you break the fish off. I I'm usually fishing, you know, three, three or four X for the cutthroat. And, uh, that, that's not always the ideal tippet to hold a big, big coho. Right. Right. God, this is cool. And then what is the fight? If you compare the three coho cutties and, uh, and bull trout, how's the fight different when you get them hooked? Uh, I think the coho are probably my favorite to hook because Hmm. they, they have a tendency to just go nuts. They're, they're really explosive. I've done a lot of, a lot of coho fishing in Alaska too. And I've always just kind of likened it to a rodeo. Like I, I don't feel like you as an angler have to do a lot to, to sort of tire the fish out. All you have to do is, is, is hold your ground and, and hold on. <laughs> no, don't get bucked off. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's, it's a rodeo. They, they're going to go airborne. They're, they're going to, they're going to twist and run. Um, they, they wear themselves out pretty quickly, but it's, it's really fun because it's, it's fairly unpredictable. Um, the bull trout, 
uh, a bigger one will will run on you. They they tend to fight a little bit more like a brown. Like they'll you're going to get a lot of head shakes and and yeah. uh, it's kind of a dogged fight. But they I've never seen one jump. They don't make blitzing runs. Hmm. Um, the the cutthroat will kind of do a little bit of ever, everything. There's there's sort of a cross between the coho and the and the bull trout in terms of their fight. Today's episode is sponsored by Fishhound Expeditions, putting together remote Alaskan fishing trips for that trip of a lifetime. This is not your typical lodge style trips. These are remote floating down the river uh, Alaskan trips. Uh, you're going to be mousing for rainbows, fishing for salmon, camping on the river. This is what it all comes down to, a great river trip. And you know we've had a few episodes where people have noted um, how important it is to, to not wait for that trip you never know how life what life's going to throw at you so if you get a chance and you want to you've been thinking about alaska and you've been thinking about a remote trip check out what adam and fishhound has right now you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash fishhound right now to check out what they have going on right now that's fishhound f-i-s-h-h-o-u-n-d you support this podcast by clicking through that link to fishhound yeah, this definitely gives us some good uh, perspective on opportunities. And the cool thing is, like you said, you got the starting in the summertime, you know, June, July, there's stuff going on all the way through January. And then if the steelhead's open, you could even fish into like January, February, March, April. What, what's the, is there like April, May, you know, that period, March, April, May, is that kind of, um, what's your focus then? Or is that your break, your fly tying time? That is... So depending on the conditions, there there is typically a spring cutthroat fishery that's mm. that's been pretty stable. Um, I often end up not fishing it a lot, um, but the lower river, so from basically from the the Memorial Highway in Mount Vernon, which is down kind of toward the mouth of of the Skagit, all the way down through the, the Skagit splits toward the mouth into a north and south fork and so that lower section of river opens march 1st for for cutthroat and bull trout and if if the river is not super high at that time it can actually be really good um that coincides with the the salmon fry out migration so if if you've had you know decent Chum returns, you'll, you'll have chum fry and in some years pink salmon fry migrating down river and the, the bull trout and the cutthroat will just kind of lay in wait and ambush them. And so you're, you're going to fish it in a very similar fashion to how you would fish for, for cutthroat in the late summer and fall. But we tend to fish a lot of a lot more imitative patterns at that time, like like little little salmon fry and salmon smoke patterns. And so you you have that in May the Skagit it, we're usually starting to see some runoff kick in and and the river's pretty out of shape. Some years they'll open a, a spring Chinook fishery in the in the lower portion of the river, but that that one's hit and miss. So that's it. So. Yeah, we we you know we obviously haven't focused on steel it here, but there's uh, you know and that's you know, a lot of times is the Skagit's kind of known for, like we said at the start, but, um, you know, hopefully that'll keep, uh, getting better as we go. Maybe if the, the numbers, it looks like they're kind of turning around in some areas from some lows we had the last few years. So, so hopefully do, do you see that as you look out at steelhead, maybe the next, you know, five, 10 years, um, do you have more of a positive outlook on it or what's your take there? I, I try to stay positive about it. I mean, a, a lot of it's, uh, a, a lot of it's, kind of cyclical and you know there's there's some things we have a little bit more control over than others you know o ocean conditions is always a, a tough nut to crack but i mean some of, some of the bright spots are i think if if you look at a lot of our rivers in the puget sound area you know many of which were were heavily logged um decades ago a lot of that habitat has has recovered and and I would say arguably in a lot of areas, we, we actually have better, some better habitat than we did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was really encouraged this spring um, in, in doing the, the steelhead red surveys. We, we didn't have a spring steelhead fishery on the Skagit this year. Uh, the, the numbers 
uh, I think the forecast was just shy of, of what would have been needed to, to open a catch and release fishery. Um, but out doing the red surveys, this was the third highest year on record um, since Bill started doing his surveys 14 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I, I had a day on, uh, on Finney Creek, which was the main, um, kind of that, the, the largest of the lower or middle river tributaries. Um, I, I had a day, it was May 4th. Um, I had like 42 reds that I saw and 10 live steelhead and, wow. and yeah, m- multiple, big bucks fighting and fighting one another to get to spawn yeah. with a hen. It was, it was pretty awesome. What do you think was your biggest uh, buck that you saw spawning? How, how, how many pounds? Uh, the biggest one I saw this year was, was 14 yeah. pounds or so, which would have, would have been, th- that was my estimate. Uh, it was interesting this year. One, one thing we, we saw overall, and I think in, in, talking with John McMillan and, you know, some of the guys surveying over on the Olympic Peninsula, the fish numbers weren't bad, but, but there were a lot of small fish. Like, you know, you usually, yeah. I, you know, especially on a river like the Skagit, eight pounds would be a small fish to, mm-hmm. to me for a wire, wild winter steelhead. We were seeing fish that were like 24 inches, 25 inches and, and, uh, you're kind of looking at it going, is that, is that a steelhead or is that just a really nice trout? Right. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's it. Gosh, this is cool. Well, let, let's start to, let's take it out of here. We got a couple of items I want to check in with you on. And uh, since we didn't get into the steelhead deep, I got a, a little opportunity with our um, kind of a, like I mentioned before this list gay trip, um, we're doing a little deal at wetflyswing.com slash giveaway where we're doing a little uh, promo to get some uh, some people. This is like a steelhead school. So if anybody's interested, whether this is going to be out actually in the Midwest, but um, you know anybody that's interested and want to connect with that, they can go there. But I'm kind of tying that into you, you know, your, your kind of bucket list trip, right? Your lodge or your um, destination. Do you have something there, the place that you kind of like want to, it's on your list that you haven't got to yet? Oh, uh... That's a tough one. There, there are so many of them. Um, yeah. I, if, if we're talking steelhead, I've, yeah, I've always wanted to go do, uh, the Kamchatka peninsula. Yeah. And, and that, yeah, that, that, that That's looks it. incredible to me. I think the the likelihood of doing that in the next few years is probably no pretty slim. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> given right. all that's going on in the world, but Beyond that, the, the Seychelles has been a big one for oh, me. Oh yeah. Of course, there's no steelhead there, but I I, I enjoyed your your some of your podcasts with uh, Yako Lucas. And, oh yeah. And uh, Keithiness Rose. Yeah. And, uh, that's a place I just need to get there. I we, we didn't talk about it today, but I, I absolutely love the the saltwater flats fishing. Oh, like, you do. That's, that's become kind of my in the in the absence of of reliable steelhead fisheries, I. I seem to plan more and more trips every year to go somewhere and, and fish for bones. And Oh, right. Do you have a lodge you want to give a shout out to or a lodge trip? Uh, let's see. I'm going back. I, I, I went for the first time last year and I'm, I'm going back again this December, uh, to Kyle Francis farm and fly. It's on, uh, Ambergie key and, uh, in Belize. Oh yeah. And, and it's kind of a DIY, uh, like stand up paddleboard. Oh, wow. Bonefish, uh, lodge, which is, Jeez. which is just super cool. I, I, I'm one, I, if I can do it on my own two feet or, or do it myself, uh, you know, guide guides are great people and you can learn a lot from them. I just, I have this thing. I, I like to do it on my own and mm-hmm. kind of do, do my own thing. And so yeah. to, to be able to go out on a paddleboard and, and, you know, fish these, these, lagoons and, and tight spots that you, you couldn't get a flat skiff back into is, is pretty awesome. So I'm, I'm excited to go back there. Wow. That sounds awesome. Yeah. And you think, uh, I guess I'm sure you do your research and prepare, but if somebody else wanted to DIY it, it's definitely doable to go out there. Oh, and very, find... very much so. That, yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of what the, the camp program is set up there. And it's, they're, they're 
they're great people that, uh, that run the camp. It's, it's awesome food. Uh, I would say rustic, but comfortable accommodations. And it, it, it's a nice relaxing place to kind of get off the grid and, and, uh, um, yeah, now, now that uh, Alaska Air is doing seasonal direct flights to Belize City out of Seattle, it's like a six-hour flight for me to get down there. And Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Gee, six hours and you're in Belize. Yeah. All right. There's another another one to add to my bucket list. This is uh, <laughs> I got a buddy, Greg, a good friend of mine. He's a big – same thing. He loves the DIY stuff. He's always planning like, okay, where's my next DIY thing? And and yeah, it's cool. It's cool to hear you can you can definitely do it on your own. Um, well, let's let's take it out. We're gonna have this is the the new segment, the resources, uh, rando and the wrap out, and we're gonna have a battle of the uh, a little battle of the champions here. We've been talking about three species, but let's talk resources for a sec. So we talked about coho, cutthroat, bull trout. Um, where do you send? You know, if somebody wanted to take this further, it sounds like you're pretty knowledgeable here, obviously. But you know, for like bull trout, I know that questions come up from listeners where. You know, where would somebody go to get more information on fishing bull trout? Do you know of any sites out there, any resources? Um, seems like it's kind of, seems like it's a little bit like you don't hear much about bull trout. I know up in Canada, there's some stuff going on, but uh, yeah. Do you, or is this all like self-taught on your, with your own stuff? You know, there, there's not a lot of great resources. And I think part for bull trout in particular, and I think part of that is, is because, you know, through, through much of their range, you're, you're not allowed to target them. Um, right. And, uh, oddly enough, and I, I, I definitely don't agree with this regulation, but, uh, on the Skagit, you can actually harvest bull trout. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. If o- over 20 inches. And hmm. I think, I think that's a, a bad move. Bulls are certainly the kind of the canary in the coal mine in terms of mm-hmm. water quality and water conditions. And I think as, as, the climate changes and things warm up, they're going to be one of the most susceptible fish um, yep. in, in losing some of their cold water habitat. So it's like, you know, leave them alone, keep that, yep. uh, that population, uh, you know, robust and, and diverse. Yeah. I would say, uh, I, I do, uh, a monthly newsletter at the shop and I've, I've got like all of our, his, kind of our, historical blog posts up on the website Mm -hmm. uh i I originally went to my my major was english um with a writing concentration so i love to write and Uh i i I have a pretty pretty big pretty extensive newsletter blog post i'll do you've got stuff covered you've got it covered like bull trout somebody wanted to go there and just be like you know look at one of the trips you did you got it covered yeah, if you if you were to read through a lot of those those posts, you'll you'll pick up a lot of information on uh, on bull trout. I, I I would say, in a lot of ways, like most of your bull trout fishing is not radically different than than streamer fishing for, for yeah. big browns. Okay. Uh, you, you know, elsewhere in the the west or in the yep. midwest. Um, but in terms of lear- learning more on the the fish. I would say too, there's some interesting studies you can uh, read on the the internet. If you Google like uh, Seattle City Light bull trout studies and and things things like that, there are some some interesting kind of scientific articles on uh, on bull trout migration and and things like that, which I, I think are really helpful in kind of getting a sense of what part of the river should I be looking for fish in um, right. this there time you know. of year and so forth. Perfect. 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 This is good. And and what about for uh, cutthroat or coho? Any, any other? Is it similar? There's not as many resources out there for those? Not necessarily specific to the, the Skagit, but uh, I, I mean, in turn, I think... Uh, you know, for really for, for both species, uh, I think two of the best resources out there that, that I found over the years were, uh, Les Johnson's books, um, uh, fly fishing for Pacific salmon and, uh, uh, oh, fly yeah. fishing for, for coastal cutthroat, uh, just, just very complete, lots of great information on fly patterns, techniques, um, and, uh, 
yeah, ev- everybody should own own a copy of those. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I was just looking back at our catalog, and you mentioned the streamers. That's what's great. We've we've done a number of streamer episodes. Um, you know, so that's another place I could. I'll put a link to a couple of those past ones. I think we had Tommy Lynch on, the, and uh, recently he talked about some of the some of that stuff. But yeah, no, I remember. Yeah, Les John. That's definitely a classic. Those are classic books for sure. Yeah. I, I heard your episode with uh, with Kelly Gallup too. Oh like, yeah, like any of his patterns work work yeah. very well for bull trout, and a lot of the the tips and techniques he shares uh, about you know that are rele- relevant to to targeting big browns and rainbows on other rivers. You can apply those to the bull trout too. Oh good, good, good. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Kelly Kelly is definitely the man on that. So we'll, we'll get a Kelly Gallup. Uh, shout out episode in there um so good so we got a couple of resources so the, so the rando the random piece here um you mentioned cheers so i'm gonna go uh, we already had that covered but i'm gonna go to the the podcast because i know you listen to some podcasts so um so looking at your you know if, if you want to look at your app whatever you l- listen to what are the last five podcasts that you listen to maybe not your last five favorites but the last five you know and you can uh um, you could probably take us out of it <laughs> if we were lucky enough to be in that list, but, but who, yeah, any other podcasts you want to give it five, five you, other ones? You, uh, yeah, you, you would make the five. But, oh, nice. Uh, nice. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm still, uh, I'm still a little bit of a fledgling in, in exploring the, the, the podcast. Oh, good. Book. You're kind of a newbie. Uh, You're like a newbie podcast. I, 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 I am. I'm, I, I am a lump of clay ready to be. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. You got all sorts of, you, the world is your oyster, right? But I mean, you got a huge, I mean, podcast, there's a bunch yeah. of like for anything, right? Any topic you, you have out there, you like, you enjoy any hobby, there's a podcast for it. Oh, def- definitely. Um, no, and it's it's really uh, pretty fascinating, and the, and and they're all they're all very different in terms of how they're they're structured. And I I think I like I like different ones for different reasons. Like there there've been a couple that I've I've listened. Well, one I listen to regularly is not is actually not fishing related at all. Yeah, it's, it's the uh, the Smartless podcast. Oh. Yeah, the smart list. So that's what I want. Yeah, let's hear. Let's hear. Like, what? What? It, it doesn't have to be fly fishing. Just and yeah. I and I love the smart list. Yeah, that's Jason. Um, Jason Bateman and yeah, uh, Will, and Will Will Arnett, Will Arnett, and Sean Hayes, and yeah, I, I absolutely one. love that one. Yeah, um, these guys are funny. And uh, it is. It, it's it's just the nonstop witty banter. Yeah, just like today. Just like today, we've had that pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and honestly, like that, that to me represents like a typical day in the, in the fly shop. Like I've, al- I've always wanted to, if I could just somehow record right the conversations throughout the day and how one thing bleeds into another, it's a lot of just like rambling and, and wit and joking. Yep. You just came up with a Scott, you just came up with your own podcast. It's, it's going to be, you just press record and have a sign on the door that says, Hey, we're recording this for a podcast and you record everything. And then you just pick, you know, the, the best content for an episode each week. There you go. <laughs> that that, that could be interesting. The confluence. The, there might be a uh, confluence podcast out there already. Yeah. What, what else? Uh, listen to Hank Patterson's oh, yeah. uh, outdoor misadventures. Oh yeah. Like Travis is just, a funny, funny dude. He is. And, uh, I, I think the the satire he does in fly fishing is. Uh, oh man, God, it's great. What's the uh, What's your favorite? We we had Hank on on a, a past episode, and he, I put a little snippets. Of, what, what's your favorite um, Hank Patterson skit, or do you have one? Um, there's so many, right? Uh, I like the one where he's. Uh, the one where he's uh, he he's guiding from a long lawn chair and he yeah as uh, yeah with the girl is that with the little girl he's or yeah. no no yeah yeah and it's it's been forever since I've watched it but uh, yeah all of all of those just crack me up yeah it's been kind of infrequent and 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 maybe on hiatus for for a little while but another good shop banter one that I I enjoy is the the fly fish food podcast. Oh, yeah. I mean, Curtis Cheech and Lance yep. are just amazing guys. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of a lot of their just their fishing tips and and everything are are really down to earth and really really 
relevant. Um, I, yeah. I like the fact that, you know, for as known as they are, um, I, I don't see a lot of ego. I just see a lot of willingness to, to, to help and excitement about fishing. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. shop guys are, are, are really just regular people too. Yeah, um, that's a good one. So that's a good one. What else? Right, you got two more, two more to fill the, fill the slot. Two more. Oh, I don't know if I can think of. All right. Well, we can, we can stop. I did find the, um, it's uh, Hank Patterson, eight steps to better, uh, better nymphing is the one that we're talking about. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. That one's classic. That one is a good one. Nice. So, okay. Well, we'll, we'll we can, uh, we can let you off the hook here at, at three. That's, uh, you, you gave us three good ones. Smartless, Hank Patterson and fly fish food definitely are all awesome. And, uh, well, let's go back. So we, we mentioned the coho and this is kind of the battle battle of the champions here. Um, coho, uh, cutthroat and, uh, and bull trout. So what was the one that you had to pick if it, you mentioned trout, but is there one between the cutthroat and bull trout? You can only fish for one this year, this next year in 23. Uh, I'm going to go with the, the, the cutthroat. I think, yeah. uh, they're a beautiful fish. I, I, I remember reading somewhere, I don't know, this may have been in, uh, in a Bob Arnold book, I, I, I fish the, the Stillaglamish and the North Fork of the Stillaglamish a lot. And, and somebody once said that, uh, that, you know, steelhead are, a, are a young man's game and, hmm. uh, cutthroat are the, are, are the fish of, of, of boys and old men. Hmm. And I, I'm kind of enjoying that coming full circle. I mean, we all go through these progressions, fly fishing, where it's like, ah, well, I, I just want to catch a fish. Yep. Now I want to catch lots of fish. Mm-hmm. Now I just want to catch a few big fish or, or a certain species. And so I, I went through a lot of those years in my 20s and 30s where I was just, I was all in on on swinging flies for steelhead. That's, I did that 11 months out of the year. Right. I could care less to go do anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as a kid, I, I remember enjoying just the, the thrill of, of, you know, catching a fish in a small stream or, or, um, you know, beautiful cutthroat. And, and, and now, now I'm coming full circle and I'm like, I like going out and doing the thing that I don't see as many people doing and, and just enjoying fishing, you know, light rods and, and light tackle and, and catching a beautiful native species. Yeah, that's cool. That's a good take. All right, Scott, well, we'll let you get out of here. What, um, now we're kind of, this is going to be, what are we at here? Uh, kind of September, October, November. So this is, this is prime time. I mean, really everything we talked about here, what, what are you looking at when you say the next kind of, uh, six months or so, I um, mean, anything new coming with the shop or any, you want to give a shout out to anything? Um, no, I, th- I, I think we'll just, we'll kind of keep trucking along. I've got mm-hmm. a couple, couple of trips uh, I'm looking forward to this winter. Uh, looking forward to, to cutthroat and salmon fishing this, this fall. Mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of wish September and October just lasted most of the year. They're, they're beautiful months to fish just about anywhere. And yeah, they are. For anything. I know. And they go by all too quickly. Yep. But, uh, yeah, just going to kind of, kind of keep on keeping on, um, Perfect. you know, ma- maintain that balance between time in the shop, time with family and, uh, time out fishing on the water. And yeah, that's it. Those are the three right there. Family, uh, the shop family and, and on the water, right? Yeah. That's life in a nutshell, right? That's there. pretty good. Nice. All right. Well, we'll send everybody out to, um, the confluence if they want to connect with you and, um, yeah, this has been great, man. I I, I, th- I think this has been. I, I was thinking steelhead at the start, uh, and we talked about it. You know, we made a much more diverse uh, episode, which is great. So, thanks for taking all the time today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. So there it is. Wetflyswing.com slash three six five three hundred and sixty five is going to get you uh, some of the links, some of the uh, resources, and everything we talked about today. There'll also be a link to that giveaway uh, that we're launching, uh, which you can find at wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. This is a big one for the Steelhead School, heading up there with Jeff Liske. As I know it at the start, we are going to have a good time. We're heading out to a cabin. We're going to be fishing Steelhead Alley, learning about the spay, if you want to up your spay game a little bit. 
If you're like me and you've never really uh, mastered that thing or you still have some struggles, then this is the place to be. I'd love to connect with you. I'm going to be fishing with uh, Jeff. Uh, it's going to be Jeff and I with six other people that are going to be up there, um, plus a couple people who win the giveaway. And then we're going to have um, like uh, some other guides along, some other Jeff's crew who are going to help with this giveaway. So it's going to be a really cool event. Hope to see you there. Hope you can uh, jump on this. And, uh, and I appreciate you. Uh, for checking it out. All right, we're going to get off to the next one, and uh, we're going to start focusing on what we have coming up next. And what we have coming up next is, is um, we got Monday a bird hunting episode, Upland Game, bird hunting. Uh, so we're going to keep mixing this up. I always, uh, when I can, try to mix in some some other hunting, uh, fishing, outdoor-related episodes. So if you have any interest in bird hunting, check this out. I've got a uh, bird hunting guru a podcast uh host and uh and this is a good one we have a focus on grouse on that episode but after that we're going to be jumping right back into spay and we got a spay casting episode coming up on tuesday so stay tuned monday tuesday the the uh the wham bam and uh it's going to be another big week uh, we've been doing a lot of these three episode weeks and i hope you've been enjoying it if you have any feedback for me if you have an episode different topic anything that we haven't covered yet that could be fly fishing uh, hunting outdoor related uh, check in with me and let me know i'd love to get that uh, topic in for you uh, or if you have a guest i'd love to dig that one out for you as well okay we're off we are off into the next uh adventure i hope you're having a good adventure i hope your summer has been treating you well and i hope uh to catch up with you soon maybe on this trip at steelhead alley or maybe online you can reach us at wet fly swing anywhere online and I hope you are having a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening, wherever you are in the world. And I appreciate you for supporting us and being along with you on your journey. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.